used to have my bosses ticked off because they like you to be at a podium when the judges are talking to you. Um, legal aspects of computer network security. Uh, basically, here's what we're going to cover. We're going to look at some of the top precedents we had going on. Um, the legal aspects of what you can do for computer network security, and then apparently something happened recently with Google and NSA that everybody's curious about and the legal aspects of that, so I get picked up to talk about that. And if we have time, we'll move into uh, some aspects of cyber warfare. Um, when I'm invited, I always look at who am I speaking to. Cause, you know, at conferences, if you're not repeating, you don't know who you're talking to. So this is what I was given for my target audience for what we're looking at. And from that, um, it's that high energy, fun environment, which I like, because I like to semi entertain as I do this. Ask questions at any time. Um, that's the main thing. It's interaction. If you have questions on some legal aspects that you're doing for computer network security, please ask away um, at any time. We were just talking up here ahead of time about going to conferences. I am in the uh, third track here, which kind of deals with law aspects of things. And whenever I go to a conference, I always like to try to get one or two nuggets of something that I didn't know. And if I can go back and say, hey, okay, that was worthwhile. So hopefully you can take away one or two nuggets from things as you're doing as we go forward. I got to give the disclaimer that everybody gives. Um, I am here. I, I work for the government. Uh, I'm not here to help because I'm here on my own time right now. So if I was here on the government time, I'd be here to help. But uh, I, So anything I say is my own. Um, any influence that has been exerted upon me by any institutions that I've been uh, affiliated with, I'm sure was done unintentionally, and so they wouldn't want to be blamed for my opinions whatsoever. Uh, my background, um, Robert Clark. I was the legal advisor for many years to the Army CERT. Um, I moved on from there and was the legal advisor to the Navy CIO. And then I jumped ship and went and was the last legal advisor um, to the U.S. CERT. Uh, so that's my background for this. In between there, there's a stint I don't like to talk about a lot. I was a lawyer for the SEC for a while. Um, and I don't really like to talk about it because it was during that time when like the economy went south, but my, my pornography business went really through the roof. Um, so, um, you know, you can do a Google search for that aspect. Timely jokes. For those of you who speak code, um, there's my background for you. And one aspect about lawyers. Um, a town with one attorney, you can make a good living. You make a decent living. A town with two attorneys, you can make a great living. Okay? So, and, and it kind of comes into a joke that I once heard, and it was when somebody said, what's one plus one? Now, you computer scientists, you mathematicians, if you ask you folks, you'll say one being a positive number, you know, one being a positive number, that would be two. If you ask an attorney what one plus one is, they'll say, what do you want it to be? And that really is true, because if you take your fact pattern and you give it to any numerous lawyers, you will get a different answer depending on what you want the answer to be. Um, and so that's very important to understand that when, when you're talking with lawyers. So you can get a fact pattern. We can talk about things here. I'm going to try to stick to what's called black letter law. I'm going to try to look at what the facts were that presented to the case, what the judge said, what the law was from that. But if you take these facts and ask someone who's a defense attorney, who's from EFF, that's representing you, they're going to give you a different answer from the aspect of it than what a government lawyer might give you. Now, the only thing to remember from that aspect is, and I used to tell my clients this all the time, at the end of the day, I'm going to go home and have my steak dinner. So what you're really risking or what you're willing to put on risk is, you know, it's possibly jail time. So what you're comfortable with, people have different bents on that. Who knows what that last acronym is by any chance? You guys are so sharp, I tell you. You guys must go to Black Hat and DEF CON too. I am not your lawyer. All right, one more thing. I'm not Richard Clark, so I can't sign this book. I have no relation to him. He's not my dad. He's not my uncle. And God forbid, he's not my brother. I, I, he's 60. I, I hope I'm not getting there yet um, from that aspect. But if you do pick up his book, um, make sure you take it to the book signing and not like your iPad or your electronic version of it because like when he writes his name all over the cover, it ruins your iPad and so you can't see anything. All right, I like starting off with this case, although it's interesting because it's a 2005 case, so that's kind of getting old, particularly for, for Internet standards. In this case, Mr. Prockner was busted coming across the Canadian border because he had a bunch of credit card numbers written on a piece of paper, and so they got him for credit card theft, identity fraud, and they elevated his sentences. They did a sentence elevation because he used special skills to get this information. So he, he was supposed to be sentenced to about zero to six months. He ended up getting 25 months. He had some other elevating factors with it. But when you get your sentence elevated, it, it bumps it up for how much time you can do in jail. 
it was an interesting case because the judge looked at, did this require a special skill to pull this off? And, and the court basically said, and the reason I, I share this is because the court has recognized your profession as requiring the special skills. For jail time, that's not a good thing, but you, you guys are special and you have special skills. Now, in this case, the interesting aspect about this, Proctor had the right to remain silent, but he apparently did not have the ability to remain silent. <laughs> Because he gave a detailed confession on what he did in these steps, and that was the evidence the judge used to say, you have special skills. Now, he was arguing, hey, wait, wait, I had no formal training. I, you know, I didn't go to school, I didn't get education. Judge recognizes that sometimes you can self-teach these special skills, and this was uh, an interesting case. I do note that they, they, the judge included pilots, lawyers, and demolition experts as having special skills. So, an interesting aspect from that. For, my perspective of, uh, I now do oversight and compliance for DHS for cybersecurity information. And from my perspective, how an IP address is treated is pretty important to me. If you're doing cybersecurity and an IP address is considered personally identifiable information, depending on what company you're with or what you're doing, you're going to have to protect that under different standards. So to me, this is a pretty, pretty key thing in which this case ruled that an IP address is not personally identifiable information. The EU does not treat it the same way. So it's just kind of a, a note to take away on this. Now, there's been a lot of cases out there talking about IP addresses, that it's a, a four-part uh, four number, that it's like your telephone number, that there's no reasonable expectation in a telephone number, so there's no reasonable expectation in your IP address. So that's what came out of this case. This case was a Microsoft case that basically um, said that Microsoft would not obtain personally identifiable information for your computer, and they got a class action suit saying, well, when you're, I'm sending, you know, you're updating my software, you're getting my IP address, that's personally identifiable information. The Microsoft case uh, attorneys cited precedents, which is always good, from a 2006 and a 2007 case, one out of the Sixth Circuit, which is kind of your Midwestern range up in uh, near Minnesota, Michigan, and uh, Ohio, and then the, the Central District of California. We always like it when the Central District of California gets cited because the Ninth Circuit out there, which obviously is handling those whole areas of California and everything, is always a very, very robust practice for cybersecurity law. Um, and basically, the court went on to say that you're right, um, an IP address is not PII. They, they had in their uh, glossary at the end of the EULA um, that, you know, what could be PII, and, and included uh, the IP address. But they argued, we never incorporated this by reference into the actual agreement, and so, therefore, it, it shouldn't be included in that, and the court bought off on it, um, on it, and so an IP address is not personally identifiable information. Secure your wireless router. Um, these cases are, are the ones that um, EFF does really like, and I agree with them, too, um, in terms of access. If you hop on somebody's wireless router, is it a crime? Um, and this one was an interesting one from a, a flip side of it. Um, basically, it was looking at what the question of, in the internet age, of communications and the internet. The Quan case that's up here just went to the Supreme Court. It was argued this week. And so we're going to talk about that in a little bit about Quan. It has to do with workplace monitoring on this. But this was basically looking at an unsecured router, a shared iTunes library, and, and a home wireless aspect. Um, and for a Fourth Amendment, the key aspect on this is, can you have a Fourth Amendment search in your house you know, or, or, or in your house, can technology look inside your house and not be a Fourth Amendment search? The Kilo case on that one uh, basically was a guy had a, a grow site in his house, and the cops knew it, uh, but they could not bust him. They couldn't find the evidence to get the search warrant. So they went and got thermal imaging because they had the lights growing, the marijuana going up in there. And so from the thermal imaging, they went and they looked at the house, saw the big uh, signature that gave off. Based on that, went and got a search warrant. And the court said, no, you, you can't do that because you can't use technology that's not in general public use to enhance your sensibilities to look inside that house to find out if there's a crime being committed in there. Now, I can take a drug-sniffing dog and have him sit on your front porch if it's you know where guests are coming in and out. They're saying that's in your curtilage, which is where your property is, but it's such a common access way. I can have a drug-sniffing dog sit there, and if he alerts, then I can use that to get a search warrant. But as far as the thermal imaging, I can't do that. I, I guess, one, they haven't ruled that a dog is technology, and, and two, I guess dogs are in common use. And so uh, it's not, you know, it's in public use. So this 